Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. This is, this is really quite an honor. Um, so I, I, I want to save plenty of time for questions. I know we're going to uh, talk soon. So um, I'll just start by telling you a little bit about uh, how I became a speechwriter and, um, and then share three really quick stories uh, before we get into the Q&A. Um, so I didn't grow up thinking that I would uh, pursue a career in politics. And I sort of fell into speech writing completely by chance. Uh, in college, I'd been an intern for John Kerry. Uh, and when I graduated, I was offered a, a job on his campaign. Um, the title was Assistant Press Secretary, which was a fancier way of saying that uh, I answered the phones, got people coffee, and, uh, and woke up at 4.30 AM every morning to send around the day's news stories to, uh, to everyone in the campaign. I never slept, I drank too much, gained about 20 pounds, uh, so it was a very glamorous life. Um, and then one day, uh, the campaign's chief speechwriter uh, was, unfortunately for him, moved to the desk uh, right next to mine. And I thought he had the greatest job in the world. Uh, so of course, I bugged him in the way that 22-year-old assistants bug people that they professionally admire. I asked too many questions, I offered too much help. And then one day, I finally found the courage to ask him if I could be his deputy speechwriter. Uh, and he immediately said no. Um, <laughs> but, then, uh, but then one day after that, when the campaign was losing and broke and couldn't afford to hire a real deputy speechwriter, uh, I became the most affordable option available. Um, so, I, so I was John Kerry's deputy speechwriter. And then a few months later uh, came my second lucky break, though it didn't seem so at the time. Uh, during the 2004 Democratic Convention in Boston, I was assigned the task of making sure that all the speakers and speeches reflected the message of the Kerry campaign to the extent that there was a message of the Kerry campaign. Um, <laughs> some days it was hard to tell. Um, and one day uh, I get a call from the powers that be on the campaign uh, who told me that there was a problem with the draft of the keynote address being delivered by the young senator from Illinois, Barack Obama. Apparently, Obama had written the exact same line in his keynote address that Kerry wanted to use in his convention speech. And somehow my job was to walk down the hall, interrupt Barack Obama's speech prep, and ask him to change the line. Um, so that was an enviable task that I was assigned. Um, so I sheepishly walk into the room where Obama's practicing his speech for the very first time, mumbled something about the line, and then uh, lock, blacked out for a few seconds. Um, and when I came to, Obama was within a couple inches of my face glaring down at me and asked, are you seriously telling me I have to take out my favorite line from this speech? So great first impression with my future boss. Um, and at that point, you know, I figured I would uh, never talk to Barack Obama again, which was really too bad because when I heard his keynote the next night, I thought it represented everything that was missing from politics. It was honest. It was authentic. It didn't sound like language that came from a consultant or a pollster. It told a story. And then John Kerry lost, and I was crushed. I was only 23 years old, but I had already become desperately cynical about politics. I wanted to give it all up, and at that point I sort of had to because I was completely broke. So broke <laughs> that when I drove home to Boston from Washington to move back in with my parents, uh, I actually didn't have enough money to pay the last toll on the highway and had no choice but to speed through the red light. Um, so that was rock bottom. Uh, and then a couple weeks later, uh, I received an email that changed my life. One of my bosses from the Kerry campaign was now a top aide to Senator Barack Obama and told me that he was looking to hire his very first speechwriter. My interview with Obama was surprisingly easy. We talked about our families, we talked about where we grew up, talked about why we both got into politics. But most of all, we didn't talk about the line I made him remove from his convention speech because he didn't remember it was me. <laughs> um, so that was very lucky. And, uh, and then at the end of the conversation, uh, he said something I'll never forget. He said, I still don't think I need a speechwriter, but you seem nice enough. <laughs> Um, so that's how I got that job. Um, so 
like I said, three quick stories and then we get into Q&A. Uh, and these are things that I learned by working with Barack Obama. First story I want to tell is about authenticity. So sometime around March uh, in the 2008 campaign, the media uncovers a series of videos that show Barack Obama's pastor, Reverend Jeremiah White, right, making some very anti-American, anti-white comments in church. Now, this is the man who married the Obamas, who baptized their children, and whose church the family had been going to for many, many years. So it's a big problem. Um, now, initially, our campaign, a lot of the advisors on the campaign, advised the president to play it safe. They said, let's drop some talking points, let's set up interviews on all the cable news channels, and hopefully we don't have to get into any of the messy details and we can just skate by this. But the president decided that he didn't want to play it safe. He wanted to give a speech about race in America. And as someone who thought he might be the first African-American president in history, he'd been wanting to give a speech on race for quite some time. Um, but our advisors kept putting it off because we were trying to win Iowa, a state that has at most two or three African-Americans. Um, <laughs> but Obama said, I don't care anymore. The only way that I'm getting through this is if I give this speech and I give it the way I want to give it. So uh, he decides that he wants to give the speech on a Friday. Saturday morning, everyone tells me that he wants to give the speech, and they tell me that it's going to be Tuesday, and they ask me to please produce a draft. Um, and then I said some things that aren't fit for saying right now. Um, and, uh, and I said to them, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not writing a draft. I'm not even starting a draft until I get to talk to him, because this is an incredibly personal thing. So after campaigning until about 10 PM that Saturday, um, he called me to lay out the speech that he would give in Philadelphia a few days later. And if you look at that speech today, I can tell you that the parts that I wrote were parts that could have been delivered by any politician. The parts that Barack Obama wrote were lines like, I can no more disown Reverend Wright than I can my white grandmother. A woman who loves me as much as she loves anything in this world, but who more than once has uttered racial or ethnic stereotypes that made me cringe. That's not a line that any speechwriter or strategist would have suggested to their boss if they wanted to keep their job. And I remember that after the speech was over, the president called and said, I don't know if this speech will make the problem go away, and I don't know if you can get elected president saying the things I did about race, but I also know that I don't deserve to be president if I'm too afraid to say what I believe. So the second story I want to tell you is about humor. One of the best pieces of advice that I've ever received is take your job seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. So I'll give you an example. Some of you may remember that back in 2011, there were some uh, critical unanswered questions about whether President Barack Obama was actually born in the United States. Fortunately for America, a man uh, some of you may have heard of named Donald Trump um, was on the case. So, uh, so Trump, uh, it's hard to believe this happened. Trump sent a, uh, a full team of investigators to Hawaii um, to uncover the birth certificate and much to our surprise at some point we were standing there in the White House and the president had his lawyer fly to Hawaii and fly back the actual long form birth certificate so he could present it to America in front of the press corps in the White House press briefing room uh, in, on one Friday afternoon. So as usual, a very productive day in Washington. Um, <laughs> and yet, even after all that, nothing put the birth certificate controversy to rest more than the jokes the president told about it at the White House Correspondents' Dinner that very same weekend. So we had decided at that point that we were going to really go after Trump and really go on the birth and just make light of the birth certificate thing to really put it to rest once and for all. So the president walked out on stage and announced that um, Mr. Trump's investigators had also uncovered the president's live birth video, um, which he was willing to play in the interest of full disclosure. And as the video began playing, the crowd erupted when they realized it was actually the birth of Simba from The Lion King. Um, <laughs> with Circle of Life blaring in the background. And uh, I had the pleasure of being seated directly behind Donald Trump at the dinner, and uh, he was not very happy. <laughs> um, now, I have told the story many times, 
And uh, usually at this point I say, and fortunately we haven't heard from Mr. Trump again. <laughs> I can no longer say that. <laughs> um, but I was asked the other day uh, by the, uh, by the editor-in-chief of, of BuzzFeed uh, if, I had, uh, if I felt responsible for trolling Donald Trump into running for president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> because some people think that he was so angry at that dinner of how embarrassed and humiliated he'd become that he had vowed to get his revenge there. So, um, hoping that didn't happen. Um, but I just, I checked YouTube the other day and the video of the press conference where Obama showed his real birth certificate, sort of the substantive moment where he actually presented proof has 44,000 views on YouTube. The Lion King video has over six million right now. Um, just to give you an idea of the effectiveness of humor in politics that we somehow uh, sometimes underestimate. Um, last story I want to tell is about idealism. It is really difficult to maintain your idealism today. And I completely understand why cynicism can seem like a logical response to the daily flood of headlines about problems that can't be solved and people who behave badly, celebrities and CEOs and politicians who are supposedly driven only by ego and ambition and greed. It's hardly original to point out that trust in major institutions has declined all over the world as more of our leaders' mistakes and deficiencies are revealed and reported and analyzed over and over again. But here's the truth. So long as institutions like government, media, business, and faith are created by human beings with all our faults and imperfections, they will frustrate us, and they will disappoint us, and they will let us down. Cynicism is one response to this reality. If you want, you can approach the world with constant distrust and suspicion. You can be a critic who just throws rocks from the sidelines which requires very little effort or creativity. You can disengage from the public debate altogether and leave the big decisions about your future to somebody else. But just remember, cynicism isn't the only response to humanity's inadequacies and limitations. Cynicism is a choice. It is just as much of a choice as service to others or commitment to a worthy cause. As my old boss taught me, Cynicism is just as much of a choice as hope is. From conflicts to tragedies to outbreaks, there is a lot of bad news out there. But despite all the turmoil, it is also true that we live in a world where fewer people are dying young and more people are living longer. It is a world where there are more girls in school, more adults who can read, a world with less hunger, less poverty, and less deadly disease than at any time in human history. It is a world where fewer nations are at war and more democracies are protecting more people's basic human rights. All of these trends are real. And none, none are the result of vague forces or happy accidents. People made this progress. People chose to make this progress. Many people working over many years. People in governments and nonprofits. People with great power and wealth. And people with very little of either. People who, despite all of their flaws and their failings and their shortcomings, decided to press forward, believing against all odds that there has to be an upward trajectory to the journey that we're on together. I'll be honest, I, I fight the urge to be cynical every single time I turn on the news. But in those moments, I often think about one of the most inspiring things I've experienced during my time in politics. It was the night of the 2008 election, but it wasn't the moment that they called the race for Barack Obama. It was earlier, as I was making edits to that night's speech. The draft ended with a story we found about a woman from Atlanta named Ann Nixon Cooper, who had waited in line that day for three hours to cast her ballot. Three hours. And what made that story so special was the fact that Ann Nixon Cooper was 106 years old. She was born at a time when she wasn't allowed to vote for two reasons, because she was a woman and because she was African American. So as the election results start looking good, my friend points out that, you know, we should probably call Ann Nixon Cooper and let her know that she's about to get a little bit of a shout out. Um, so we find her number and I give her a call. 
and I tell this frail, lovely woman that a man who's about to become the first black president of the United States wants to mention her in his victory speech. And there's a pause on the line, and I started thinking about all that Ann Nixon Cooper endured through a century that was marked by war and depression, by brutal prejudice and discrimination, a century where she pressed on as a tutor and a church volunteer and a civil rights activist, as a wife and a mother and a grandmother, a century where she somehow lived to see progress she must have only dreamed about as a child. Women's rights, and voting rights, and civil rights for all. And just then, Ann Nixon Cooper interrupted my thoughts with a very important question about that night's speech. Will it be on television? I told her, yes, yes, it would be on television. And, uh, and so she thought about that for a little while longer, and she asked, which channel will it be on? <laughs> and I said, all the channels. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then she said, I'm so happy, I'm so proud, finally. And at that point, she started to cry, and I did too. And right at that very moment, they called Ohio, and the race was over, and everyone starts cheering, and I hid under my desk for a few more minutes to talk to Ann Nixon Cooper. Now, not all the days were that fulfilling. Uh, we had just as many downs as we did ups, and the work was hard, and the hours were long, and it was frustrating, and we made plenty of mistakes. We still do. But every once in a while, there are moments that remind us why it is we do what we do. And I would just ask you, if you can learn and recognize and appreciate those moments, you'll find it's a lot easier to keep doing that work. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Well, John, thank you very much. For that that was that was fantastic. And as I just said to you, uh, you've answered most of the questions I already had down here. All done. The Perfect. Frantic writing. There we go. Um, <laughs> But no, so first of all, I must ask, what's it like writing a speech for yourself now rather than for President Barack Obama? It's funny. It's, uh, I thought it would be easy, and it wasn't when I, when I first started doing it. Because, uh, you know, like f finding my own voice after writing for the president that long was trickier than I thought it would be. I guess I didn't realize, like, even I, I even picked up his verbal tics. Right? Like, I say look a lot, and you know, look what I have said, right? which is like a classic Barack Obama thing. And um, my friends and family make fun of me for that a lot. But um, you know, once you get past that, and once, it's very freeing and very liberating after a while. Um, because you know, I loved to write bef long before I was a speechwriter. When I was little, I would write stories and stuff like that. And you know, it's, I've always enjoyed that very much. So um, it's been a lot of fun to start writing again. Um, and you say it was, uh, it's difficult to get back to your own voice. Yeah. Now, a couple of days ago, you took on a very different voice with a, a speech <laughs> you wrote. You, you wrote scary. what Donald Trump's victory speech would be if he were to get the Republican nomination. Yes, I did. I did. How did it feel to slip into those shoes or that hair? It was terrifying. I had to immediately take a shower after I was done. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I wrote that. I mean, so the reason I, I wrote that column is because um, you know, I think Trump has very successfully won a lot of media attention by, you know, with the more inflammatory things he said. The insults, the name calling, the Muslim ban, you know, all, all of that stuff. And, uh, but he's also very smart. And if you really look at his speeches, and the speech that I wrote, uh, the, the Donald Trump speech that I wrote, um, was basically, like I said, 90% of it was language that he's already used. And I think that should he get the nomination, which is a real probability at this point, um, he may, if he's smart enough, moderate himself. And he doesn't have to pivot. A lot of people say, oh, well, he wins the nomination. He's going to have to pivot and like, kind of give up a lot of his more extremist positions to you know, appeal to a broader electorate. And he's never going to be able to do that. But some of the things that he's been talking about, whether it's you know, hedge fund guys didn't build America and we need to tax them more. Um, we should have health, we, know, we should repeal Obamacare, but we should have health, universal health care in this country, and we should pay for it with an increase in corporate taxes. 
We should get rid of trade deals because they're taking away American jobs. We sh you know, like, so one thing after another, they're very populist and moderate positions that could appeal to a lot of people. Um, and so I, I sort of just wanted to prepare everyone <laughs> for what we might hear um, so people can get rid of the argument now. I mean, I, I think, I think if, it's, if it's, you know, Donald Trump and, and Hillary Clinton, um, I, I do think uh, Ms. Clinton has, uh, will win that race, but I, I don't think it's, I don't think any race against Donald Trump is going to be the easiest race. Like I think he, he could he could put up a fight by moderating his positions and sounding very populist and, and anti-establishment. And do you think you're going to get a call anytime soon to be his director of speech writing? God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> but I know my answer, so that's fine. <laughs> um, you mentioned the incident um, with Barack Obama's uh, birth certificate. Yes. There must have been so many times working in the White House where you just despair at the state of American politics and particularly the, the media in America. I, I can't imagine you have too fond memories of Fox News, for example. I don't. I don't. Um, no, look, I think, I think it's a huge problem. Um, I, I, I was saying earlier, in a way, I think Donald Trump is a uh, personification of what we see in political media today and what the media chooses to elevate today, right? So if you are a casual observer of the news, um, what you see, and this, you know, I, I, the tough thing is everyone starts critiquing the news and people automatically assume it's a left-right thing or it's a Fox News versus MSNBC thing. That, forget about that, right? If you turn on CNN, right, um, you're likely to see something sensational, something scary, you're likely to see people say that um, politicians, that we are governed by people who are corrupt and stupid, and um, that there are really bad things happening in the world, and that's it, there's no good news, it's only bad news, and we should all be scared, and, um, and these are the people that you wanna blame for all these problems. And that's actually what Donald Trump's candidacy is. <laughs> he does all those things. And I think that, you know, part of this is, you know, the, the, the industry of, uh, of journalism is such right now that, you know, it's hard to, they, they go where the clicks are, right? Because they are trying to make a profit, that is business. But I've started equating this to, um, you know, we now tell food companies that even though Americans really like sugar, we shouldn't poison so many Americans with sugar <laughs> because it's not good for them. And so I think sometimes the media will say like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's the American public that's clicking on these sensational stories. It's the American public that wants conflict. That's what sells. Absolutely. And, and we're to blame in many ways for clicking on this stuff. But in the same sense, like, there is a responsibility that the media has to present nuance and subtlety and substance that, you know, at least, especially on TV right now, they're not taking seriously. Um, and I think that helps give rise to um, extreme pessimism and cynicism in the country. There's an interesting figure I saw the other day, right, which is uh, if you ask Americans about uh, what do you think about the direction of the country, you know, right track, wrong track, as it's called in politics, you know, the wrong track is very, very, very high, 60, 70 percent, right track is like 20 percent, right? It's almost as bad as it's ever been. When you ask people how do you feel about your personal life? Are you happy with your finances, with your family, with what's going on? It's actually, people are feeling better than they have in a very, very long time. It's almost a record high. So you think to yourself, where, where, why is there a discrepancy between what people feel about their own life and what they can see in their own lives versus what they're learning about the country? Well, where do people learn about their country? Where do people hear about, how do they form opinions on the rest of the world? They do it through the news. And the news can be a very dark, scary place. Now, look, there's really, there's a lot of problems in the world. There's a lot of bad things going on that the media should cover. Um, but I think there's, there's a balance between covering the bad and covering the good news and giving people hope and giving people ideas about solutions to these problems. And I think that balance is off. Um, you're definitely right when you say conflict is what right. sells. It's what you know, the media love to have. And perhaps that's not anywhere more apparent than in presidential debates and right. candidates' debates. And so when you were preparing speeches um, for that with 
President Obama, well, what you were involved in, in mm -hmm. those. What's the difference in preparing those speeches and, and those sections of text compared to yeah. a, an inauguration speech or something like that? Uh, the main difference is uh, he did not like it too much. <laughs> um, you know, the president has never been a fan of debates. He's never been, he's never excelled at debates. Is and that debates in general or the style of debating that we see on American television? That's right, the right. style of debate that you see on American television. Um, because, you know, he saw very early on that it is a, it's a game, right? And it's sport. And, you know, you have 60 seconds on one side and 60 seconds on the other side. And, you know, the way that you answer a question is, I mean, he is first and foremost, you know, he was a lawyer, he's a professor, and he's used to build, he's used to constructing and building arguments that are logical, that start from a certain point. And oftentimes with a debate answer, you have to, at least in, uh, in American political debates, you have to flip that on its head. And you sort of start with the sound bite and the main idea, and then you sort of go backwards, and you have to also get a hit in on your opponent. You have to have a quotable line in there. And basically, it, it, it makes you seem phonier and more staged, and those are all the things that the president pushes against. And you know, it, it came to a head uh, in his, obviously he didn't do that well in his first debate with Mitt Romney in, during the re-election. And as we were preparing for the second debate, he, you know, he sort of admitted to everyone, like, I, I'm not great at this, and I'm not great at memorizing these quick one-liners and these 30-second responses because it doesn't feel authentic to me. Um, and so he really, it took a lot of work for him to, to figure that out. Now, the way that we ended up doing it was finally said, okay, you just give the answer that you want to give during prep, and then starting from the answer that you really want to give will just help you shape it so that at least it comes from you and it's authentic to you as opposed to just feeding you a bunch of lines. And, and that worked a little bit better and you know, he, was, he was more successful in that second debate, in the seems, third debate as well. It seems that's what makes a successful politician, ch changing your biggest weakness to your biggest strength. And yes. That was the approach you seemed sure. to go for. Um, thinking of something a little bit different, so obviously yourself, you are it's still very young. You were very young when you uh -huh. became the director of speech writing, the second youngest, I, I, I believe, yes. at, um, in the White House. Do you think that helped? Do you think that helped the relationship with President Barack Obama? Or, I mean, do you think it's had no impact at all? Uh, I think it helped a little in the sense that um, I hadn't been, you know, he succeeded as a politician because he wasn't around Washington and in politics for a very, very long time. And so a lot of the bad habits that politicians have, a lot of the cautions that get built into being a politician, um, he, didn't, he didn't have those. And he was willing to take on the establishment and say, okay, the way that works, the way that's always worked is really silly. <laughs> and politics is a silly game in a lot of ways, and I'm not gonna play that game. And um, to the extent that I was new and young and hadn't been around politics very long either, you know, I was able to, to write for him that way. Um, and look, and I also, my, my, my one experience in national politics before that, like I said, was the Kerry campaign. And, you know, I, I saw from, I learned from that campaign, you know, I think there was a lot of times where, you know, the real John Kerry didn't come out, right? Um, there's this thing that happens in American politics where whenever a presidential candidate loses, they, they tend to give some speech after they lose the race, whether it's Al Gore, Mitt Romney or John Kerry, and then it's this wonderful speech, and then everyone in the meeting, everyone in the country says, oh, where was that guy during the race? You know, where was that John Kerry? Where was that Mitt Romney? It's like, well, you know where they were? They were in a campaign where all of their advisors and everyone around them somehow made them too afraid and too cautious to just be who they are and to be themselves. Um, and I think that's partly what happened to a lot of our candidates. And, um, and Barack Obama, to his credit in 2008, you know, he ran like he didn't have anything to lose. And, and, and that helped him succeed, I think. Because if you run like that, you're, if you're your authentic self, you're gonna be more successful. And it may not work, right? Like sometimes you can be your authentic self and people say, well, I don't like it, right? But it's worth trying that. Because if, if for no other reason than it's the easiest thing to do, to just be yourself and say what you believe. And would you say that, so your, your relationship with Barack Obama, because um, professionally you grew up with him, you know, you, you didn't, is it fair to say you didn't necessarily know the trade hugely well before yes. working with him, so you didn't have methods that didn't necessarily work, you kind of learned those methods together. Yeah, no, I mean, one of the great gifts of the job that I had was, you know, I learned to be, I learned about politics and I learned to also be a, a, a writer 
from Barack Obama, who was a brilliant writer in his own right. But you know, we, we, I mean, a lot, a lot of us on the campaign, not just the, uh, not just the president and myself, you know, we sort of took the journey and learned the journey of politics together, um, which was, you know, which is pretty amazing. And it's this final question from me before opening up to the floor. So in your speech just then, you, you said that um, with uh, President Barack Obama's race relations speech in 2008, mm -hmm. um, he suggested a line that if any speechwriter suggested to him or any other politician, they'd probably get fired. Yeah. Did you find that the, the more you worked with him, the more bold your suggestions became and the better you knew him, the more personal you'd be in your suggestions? I do. Uh, I mean, by the time, you know, he, the reason I was able to, I felt more liberated to suggest lines and ideas and stuff like that is because he was, he just made me and everyone who worked with him feel so comfortable about doing that, right? So there's plenty of times where I would, uh, I would send a speech draft in, I would get his edits and he would say, okay, I'm changing this. And I, maybe I wouldn't agree with the change. And then I'd say, okay, well, the reason I originally had it this way was because of X. And, you know, what do you think? And he'd either say, um, oh, I get what you were trying to do, so let's, let's, let's go with that. Or he'd say, no, we're going to do it my way. He said that more. Um, <laughs> but he never made it, he never made me like, scared to do that, right? He was always kind. He was always patient. Um, on, I mean, I, people don't believe me when I said this, but in eight years of working for him, he never raised his voice once. He was never annoyed. He never got angry with me. I mean, he was just, he has the sort of personality you'd want in in a leader, regardless of party, regardless of ideology. And that's something I don't think I learned until, you know, I got to the White House and I was really involved in politics is, you know, I, I want someone to be president, to be a leader who believes in the issues that I, you know, believes in my positions and, and, and I agree with on the issues and we're ideologically aligned. Um, but also I want someone with a, a temperament, right, and um, a calm and a steady nature to be president. And I think those qualities serve leaders very well, and they're sort of underestimated um, in politics today. So then, sorry, this is the last one. So then why, why did you leave before the presidency finished? Uh, I was very tired. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it, you know, I, I, I was with him for eight years, uh, including the time in the Senate. Before that, I was on the Kerry campaign. So I spent all of my 20s um, running around on campaigns and, and being a speechwriter. And you know, it's probably the best job I'll ever have, but I, I couldn't plan a life. And um, it, it wasn't just the hours, because sometimes, you know, if the president wasn't speaking, I'd have time off, but it was not being able to plan anything. So you couldn't plan a weekend, you couldn't plan a night, you couldn't plan a vacation. There were, you know, when I was, when I was working on the second inaugural, and it was the day after Christmas, and I was like locked away and couldn't see my family because I was once again using a Christmas to either write a State of the Union or an inaugural and not speaking with my family. I was like, maybe it's time to get out of here. <laughs> there are worse ways to spend Christmases, but yeah, that's, that's true. true. That's Fair true. <laughs> um, all right, thank you for that, John. Yeah. Um, so now, if you have a question, please raise your hand high in the air and then wait for a microphone to come to you, which will amplify your voice. If we could go to the member who's currently, yes, two, a couple of rows back, three rows back, yeah. I recently read a comment made by Marco Rubio that Obama is intentionally attempting to destroy America. Yeah. And this seems to be a message reflected by all of the Republican and even some Democratic candidates. So my question is, how do you account for the popularity of anti-Obama rhetoric throughout the nomination in the media? Uh, this time around, or? Uh, this time around specifically, but I in mean, general look, as well. I, that comment by Marco Rubio is so out of line and so extreme, it's like, I don't remember, I don't remember, like, as a Democrat, right, I disagreed strongly with George W. Bush and a lot of things he did during the presidency, right? I believe he did those things because he had a certain set of beliefs that led him to those decisions. And I don't think any of those beliefs was George Bush getting to the White House and thinking, now I want to destroy America, <laughs> right? I don't think anyone runs for office thinking, yeah, you know what, I want to destroy the country that I'm part of. <laughs> um, th it's insane. That is an insane comment to make. And, you know, but fine if he wants to make it because I actually have enough, I think it was a big mistake. And they're not, and the reason that Marco Rubio and his campaign made that comment is because Rubio is in a position where he feels like he is not, it's basically like a, a race to see who can be the craziest, right? And Rubio's worried that he's losing that race to Donald Trump and to Ted Cruz. And he doesn't want to take he doesn't want to talk about his positions 
because he's thinking to himself, okay, I could actually get to the general election. And if all my comments are about my positions, if I go out there and talk about how um, you know, I'm against abortion, even in, in uh, cases of incest and rape, um, you know, that's going to hurt me in the general. The one thing that won't hurt me in the general is if I just talk about how awful Barack Obama is, right? So his advisors are probably telling him that the way to appeal to your base, forget about issues, just, just hit Obama as much as possible and then be positive and hopeful about the country, right? And sound like an optimist. So that's his plan. But he took it too far by saying that comment and not walking back from it either. Because I think in a general election, when the American people are faced with someone who believes that the guy in office right now is intentionally trying to destroy America, they're not, they're not gonna buy that, you know? And, um, and it's crazy too, because it's like, you know, I, 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 like if, if he really thinks that Obama's trying to destroy America intentionally, why hasn't he called for Obama's impeachment? Why doesn't, think, why doesn't he think Obama should be tried for treason? If the, if the commander in chief is intentionally trying to destroy the country. I mean, it's just, it's so insane. Um, I have strong feelings about that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. Um, if we could please go to the member here in the second row. Hi. So, so while the global media can really pick up one line from the entire speech, yes. and they project it as something, you know, very different from what, out of context, right? So as the writer, because you've just mentioned that within the duration of two days, you'll have to present a speech. How did you uh, manage that? And number two, uh, how true is House of Cards? <laughs> <laughs> it was going to happen at some point. I yeah, know, I know. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll take the second question first. Uh, uh, it's not at all like House of Cards. Um, I won't give away any plot points in House of Cards <laughs> uh, in case anyone wants to see it. But no, I mean, House of Cards is just, uh, it's, it's a, like a, a soap opera, really. Um, but uh, no, in, in terms of, what lines are gonna get picked up in a speech. You wanna be somewhat cognizant of that, but I think there's a danger in um, writing the speech, uh, all, you know, to, to make it all about sound bites, right? Because before I started working for Barack Obama, you know, I sort of, speech, I, I saw speeches in American politics as like a collection of sound bites and applause lines. And I think a lot of politicians in both parties sort of do that to this day. And what Obama taught me, and what he showed the world on stage at the 2004 convention, is that a really good speech is a story from beginning to end. And sometimes when you're telling a story from beginning to end, like he did in that speech, it's hard to find one or two lines um, to take out and have that be like the quote, you know. I, there, was, there was a reporter who would always ask me, uh, okay, that speech that you just did, what's the etched in stone line from that speech? What, which, which line do you see etched in stone? And I would always disappoint him by telling him like, I don't know. <laughs> um, and you know, perhaps, you know, there were times when we should have thought harder about having made, making sure the quotes were very quotable, but to, to, to the president, to myself, the most important job of a speech is to tell a story from beginning to end and to put together a logical argument um, and also to make it sound authentic. And sometimes when you're, thinking about you know, what's gonna be the line that Twitter picks up or the news or something like that, you sort of forced into writing a line that sounds a little more f phony and constructed than you might as you're just having a conversation with someone, right? Um, so I try to actually avoid that as much as possible. And, and, and hope and have faith that people will watch the whole speech. I was saying on the, on the race speech, um, the president gave that speech in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon um, and you know, only the cable networks covered it. And immediately after he was finished, a lot of the pundits on, on cable were like, you know, he might have made a uh, mistake in giving that speech in the middle of the day because it was really long and there was no quotable lines and it wasn't prime time and you know, you know, so will the race speech break through? Um, and you know, it turned out that within a couple weeks and then a couple months, there were like thousands of millions of views of the race speech on YouTube and people had taken the time to go watch that entire speech. So even though they might have seen a clip on the news that wasn't the best sound bite, they could probably tell from that speech that it sounded different and authentic enough that they wanted to go find more. You know, so if, you're, if, if you deliver a speech that's real and true to who you are and it's telling a good story, even if someone only sees a small snippet of it, they're probably likely to go find that whole speech as opposed to, oh, I just saw a snappy sound bite on the news. Well, that happens all the time, so that's not very different. 
Um, I'll get in there before someone else does. If it's not like House of Cards, is it like The West Wing? It is a combination of uh, The West Wing on its good days and Veep on its bad days. <laughs> That's what I would say. What a combination. <laughs> um, if we could please go to uh, the member on the front row here, uh, the hairband. Uh, a major motif in Obama's speeches is cynicism and defying cynicism, and you even brought it up here. And so, would you say that, like, you find your hope in the American public restored by working with Obama so much and writing these speeches that say ban, um, ban cynicism? Like, you th do you think that that's you know giving you a restored sort of faith in our in the public, even though the, a lot of people are kind of do. Um, kind of reprimand it and chastise it for yeah. being uninformed and everything. Look, I think it's, I think it's a major, it was a major theme of his candidacy. It's a major theme of his public life. Um, he, right before he ran, but he was thinking about running, he gave a speech um, where he said, you know, our, our biggest obstacle in this race, our biggest obstacle as a country right now is cynicism. And he got sort of mocked for that by like, you know, the DC set, but what he meant was, it's this belief that we shouldn't even try, right? That's the problem with cynicism. Um, I, think, I think skepticism is healthy, right? I think, and the media has a role to be skeptical and should be skeptical, and the public should be skeptical. You should question authority. You should hold people accountable, all this kind of stuff. Um, but there's a difference between skepticism and cynicism. Skepticism is healthy questioning. Cynicism is saying that there's no use in trying because motivations are all sinister. Um, and that just, and history belies that point, right? Like if you go through history, the progress that we've made as a world <laughs> uh, on many different issues shows that good things can happen. Um, so I've been thinking about this and I thought the other day about how uh, there was a week a few months back, it was a very interesting week in American politics. It started with um, a young man walking into uh, a church in uh, in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, and you know he he shot up a, he shot up a black church, and um, and and killed a lot of people. And I remember that I saw the president early that week. He was at a fundraiser in Los Angeles where I live now, and I, he was sort of reacting to the shooting, and he seemed he seemed pretty down. He seemed pretty frustrated. Um, because he knew that once again we were going to have a conversation about guns and gun violence that might not go anywhere, um, even though we had just seen another mass shooting in America. And, and so I could tell he was a little bit down. And something, by the end of that week, something had changed in him. He, he walked into that church, and he gave a eulogy there, and he started talking about grace and the power of grace. And... Um, it was amazing because it was, and then he ends up singing Amazing Grace in the church. And basically the message of that eulogy was, this shooter thought that by doing what he did, he would further divide this country. And yet watching the victim's families say they forgave him, watching people come together, watching a community come together, Republicans and Democrats, and saying it's finally time to take down the Confederate flag, right? Um, the, the, the killer didn't succeed at that goal. And that same day, the Supreme Court of the United States <laughs> upheld the health insurance law. So for the first time in 100 years, as, we, as presidents of both parties have been trying for 100 years, there would be something close to universal health care coverage in America, behind the rest of the world, but it finally happened. And over, you know, upheld the fact that, um, you know, that gay marriage was legal in America. And I thought about everything that had to happen to get to that point on all those things. The fact that on race relations, right, that an African-American president would walk into a church in South Carolina and sing Amazing Grace as the Confederate flag came down, and that he would go home that night to a White House that was uh, bathed in rainbow colors because gay marriage is legal for the first time. And all, and I thought about like all the gay Americans over the, over the course of a decades who had to have like the courage to come out to make that happen. 
and you know, and, and in civil rights, like all the people who, you know, marched in the streets for that to have happened, right? For, for progress on civil rights and on healthcare, all the people who had stories of like loved ones they lost because they couldn't afford health insurance. And you think to yourself, like, it was it was very easy to be cynical and down at the beginning of that week when you saw another mass shooting, but then five days later you have this moment of hope where you realize we're going to have bad things happen in this country and in this world, and we're not going to be able to fix them all. But every once in a while, you get that good day. And that good day doesn't come on its own. It comes because, you know, a lot of people worked for it. So. Thank you. Um, we will now go uh, to the member in the red jumper in the front row here. Yeah. Hi there. Um, if you were Bernie Sanders' speechwriter, particularly <laughs> if he wins the Democratic primary and is yes. facing a general election. Would you be encouraging him to drop his self-proclaimed ideology of democratic socialism because the word socialism would turn off a lot of American voters? Or would you be encouraging him to keep his integrity as you talked about in your speech and sort of stick with it and double down on it? You know, it's interesting. I actually think that it's not, so it's about keeping your integrity for sure, but I also think politically he probably just needs to own it, right? Because this is, again, back to authenticity, right? Like, Bernie Sanders, in the off chance, I believe it's an off chance, but I guess it's possible, that wins the nomination, um, uh, people aren't going to just suddenly forget that he was a democratic socialist. <laughs> but if he started saying, oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm a Democrat now, and I just dropped the socialism thing, then, you know, his, his biggest quality right now, the biggest reason people are attracted to him is because he seems authentic, you know? So I don't think he can run away from that, nor I don't think he, he, he shouldn't, right? If he got that far, he just needs to explain to people what that is. Now, will that succeed? It might not succeed, it might hurt him. But I think, this is what I've been saying, I think there's a bigger danger in trying to be someone that you're not and trying to give up a position that you have. It's, it's about integrity, but it's also, you know, it also dovetails with being, you know, the politically smart thing to do, at least in my opinion. Thank you for your question. Um, if we could please go to the uh, member in the yeah, light blue top. Thank you for being here today. Um, political correctness requires us to think very carefully about the words we use so that we don't offend others. Yeah. Does political correctness play an active role in shaping your word choice when you write speeches for the president? And is word choice something that you have always paid attention to? Um, before the national discussions began on this topic? Yes, yeah, I mean, look, the, a speech is all about choices, right? Uh, and language is all about choices. And when you're at that level, right, and it's, I mean, it probably played an even greater role during, in the White House than it did in the campaign trail. Because um, when you're President of the United States and, I mean, there's political correctness, there's also, you know, if I got an edit on something from the Treasury Secretary um, that I didn't like, and then the Treasury Secretary said, well, yeah, if you don't say it that way, the stock market will collapse. Um, you know, I'm no economic expert, so sure. <laughs> um, if, you know, the Defense Secretary, the CIA says, oh, you can't say that, or, you know, you might start a war, you have to listen to them. Um, those, didn't, those things didn't happen, um, but that was, you know, it's just, giving an example. Um, so yeah, no, it, you, you have to be very careful. And, you know, one thing I, I've, uh, people have said before is, oh, why didn't the president, uh, you know, maybe he didn't talk about race as honestly in the White House or as much in the White House, you know? Um, and I think there's like, there's two different examples of this, right? During the Trayvon Martin incident, the president very famously said, you know, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. <laughs> So he was in the White House and, you know, he said something that that was a comment on race that, you know, was not an easy comment to make, okay? And then during some of the riots in Baltimore or in Ferguson, he was criticized for not saying more about race right there. Well, he has another consideration during those riots when a major American city is on fire, which is, do I want to say something that could possibly inflame tensions even more and actually lead to more violence, right? So, as president, when you're in, the, when you're in that position of authority and that position of power, you do have to choose your words carefully to make sure that you, know, that you are not generating real world consequences that are hurtful, harmful. Um, so yeah, so it's careful. But um, the political correctness thing is interesting. From Obama's perspective, and I think he, he talked about this in an interview too, you know, there's a tough balance, right, where 
you want to be politically correct to an extent because you don't want to you don't want to offend people, right? But at the same time, making progress is about a clash of ideas and being able to argue, right? And I'd rather learn how to argue what I believe against people that I really disagree with who are really saying awful things. But I want to be in that arena, you know, with those people and argue. And I don't want to say like, oh, if someone's coming on the college campus and they're speaking and they're awful and, you know, we should all just protest it and not go. It's like, no, I want to go to that speech and give that speaker the hardest time they've ever got. And I want to challenge them and show them how stupid they are. You know, like I, that, that to me, that's how you win. And you don't win by not participating and just protesting it, right? So that, on the political correctness thing, that's where, always where I've been. And I, I, the president said something similar, I think, the other week, too. Well, you're in the right place, so I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I was going to say, this is a good place for that. <laughs> uh, thank you for your question. Um, if we could please go to the uh, member in the blue jacket on the corner. Yeah. Thank you. Could you please speak a little bit about the process of developing the State of the Union speech? <laughs> I mean, I've got to imagine a speech that long with that many different issues, with that many different goals. It's got to be uh, quite an interesting process. Uh, interesting is a, a very charitable word for it. <laughs> um, it's, it's, the, it's the hardest speech to write um, because, look, you sort of know at the outset that a, f a speech that's going to last 50 minutes to an hour is not going to be the most memorable speech. Um, as I've been saying, like speeches are stories, and you know, if you need longer than 20 or 30 minutes to tell your story, it's probably not a story and it's more of a laundry list. And every year, we would say at the beginning of the State of the Union, you know, this is the year it's going to be different and it's not going to be a laundry list of policies. And then every year, you know, the policies just start creeping in. And that's just because you know, the point of the State of the Union is to talk to the country about all your priorities for that year, domestic and foreign, right? Domestic, international. And first of all, giving any speech where you talk about all the domestic priorities in America and then everything that's going on in the world, it's just, it's a hard story to tell. And I mean, we'd get to the point, early on in one of the State of the Unions, I think, uh, on the foreign policy side, we got a criticism from someone with, internally that was like, you've mentioned every continent but South America in this speech, so we have to, we have to say something about South America in the State of the Union. We're like, I'm like, well, do we have anything new to say about South America? Like, is there a new policy? Are we going there? It's like, no, but we just have to mention something because otherwise, you know, we're gonna screw up relations there. And, you know, it's back to what I was saying about like, sometimes you wanna to listen to this stuff because yeah, if, if not mentioning South America in the State of the Union was actually going to damage our relationship with our allies in South America, that would be a problem and you'd rather make it a more boring speech and keep the alliances strong than like, keep your story right, right? But that kind of thing happens over and over on a whole bunch of different issues. And so the tension between, you know, writing a State of the Union that's really, that sings, that's memorable, that's great, and just trying to get the job done is a very difficult one. Um, you know, the process, we try to keep the process as small as possible on the State of the Union so that it's not just everyone gets to, you know, send in their wish list and you just put it all on the speech. Uh, and that usually helps. And also, we meet with the president before the State of the Union and try to ask him, like, what are your themes this year? What are the big takeaways from the speech that you want? And once we have that, then we can kind of go to everyone else who's trying to get their pet project or their line or their policy in and say, look, this is what the president wants to talk about and this doesn't fit. And you know, we'll do another event on, on your issue right after the State of the Union. Um, and you know, we try to do it that way. So. But it's not a fun process. And you stay up like, you know, till 2 or 3 a.m., two or three weeks in a row. It's, it's, it's brutal. You, so. you were never tempted to wheel out a Disney classic to right. spice it up a little bit, no? Yes. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you for your question. Um, if we could please go to the member right by the fire escape. Yeah, in the glasses. Thank you for coming. Um, my question is, do you think any pre uh, presidential candidate has the potential to live up to the legacy that Obama will leave? when he... <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to get in trouble there. Um, I don't know. I honestly don't. Um, I think that it's hard to say that now. I'm very biased. <laughs> I, I, I very much love Barack Obama. I think he's been a wonderful president. I think he, he will be, history will treat him as a, as a very consequential president in a, in a positive way. Um, but I also think you have to leave room for you know, like in many ways, Barack Obama grew into the job, 
right? And I think other candidates can be like that too. So there's people that we might think today, you know, are not gonna be the greatest president ever and then they surprise you. Um, and a lot of it depends on the issues that come up, the events that come up and how you make decisions based on those issues, right? Um, so I think it remains to be seen, but I think, look, if you get to the level that uh, a lot of these people get to where they're running for president, there is the potential <laughs> to be, you, you hope at least, I mean, a lot of them, not all of them, <laughs> especially with some of the, one, the candidates that we have today. But, um, you know, I guess, I guess time will tell. Thank you, we have time for two more questions. Um, so could we please come to the member right here on the front. So originally I wanted to ask you what your best line was that remained undelivered, but perhaps it would be more appropriate since you were very much focusing on stories. What's the best narrative that you have built and remained undelivered? That's a very good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, and the reason I don't know is because there's not too much time to think about narratives that then don't go anywhere because usually most of the writing that I've had to do is for something that's happening right now. <laughs> so I, sorry, I sort of wish there were times where you could like sit and dream about this is what I want. No, I, I think that we've been very lucky in that um, most, most things we've wanted to say about the country and the world, most things that Barack Obama has wanted to say, he has said. Um, and even if he didn't, wasn't able, didn't have the opportunity to say them while I was there, I've certainly noticed since he's left, especially in this last year, he's been able to do that. Um, I think he, he believes in this last year that there are certain priorities where he can make progress, um, some with Congress, some on his own through executive orders and, and whatnot. And then he realizes there's a whole bunch of issues that he may not be able to make tangible progress on, but he can maybe help move the debate by speaking about them. And you know, I don't think he wants to leave anything out on the field <laughs> um, as, he, as he leaves office this year. So I think just about every narrative that he wants um, to, to talk about uh, and to deliver, he will do so this year. Thank you. Now it's time for one final question. Um, if we could please go to, uh, we'll go to the member with the glasses there. Yes, you. In President Obama's last State of the Union address, he said that his biggest regret, or one of his biggest regret, is the divide that exists in Congress. Um, so what do you think he could have done differently to bridge the divide? Yeah, it's a, it's, it is the unfinished work of his presidency. It's the unfinished work of, um, of all of us in, 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 the, in America. Um, look, on one hand, there are some technical things that we can do in our country to, to help this, right? And, and he's late. I for more on this, I would encourage you to read uh, the speech that he delivered in Illinois last week. He went back to the state capitol where he announced his, his, um, his candidacy and he sort of spoke about all the different ways that you can, we, we can fix our politics. So there's things like, you know, our congressional districts right now are drawn, in, drawn by politicians to pick their voters, basically. <laughs> the president has a good line now where, you know, politicians shouldn't pick their voters, voters should pick their politicians. Um, and right now, a lot of these districts are drawn in a way where a Democrat doesn't have to worry about a challenge from a Republican because there's so many Democrats in the district and a Republican doesn't have to worry about a challenge from a Democrat because their district is all Republican. And when you have districts like that, you have politics that become much more radical, much more ideological. Because what you're worried about is that you get a challenge from someone within your own party because you're not adhering to the party agenda as opposed to worried about compromising. Um, we have voting issues in America where, you know, too many people are turned away from the polls and it's not easy enough to vote. And you have some states where, you know, they take away things like same day registration, which would make it a lot easier to vote. Um, you know, we wanted, in some states, we're trying to make sure that when you get your license, you automatically register to vote, right? If we had more people voting in our country, that would, that would help fix our politics. Um, getting money, uh, getting so much money out of the system would help this issue. Uh, the Supreme Court made a decision in Citizens United that has let, you know, unregulated money flow through the system, billions and billions of dollars in, in these things called super PACs and no one knows who funds them. Um, and it's extremely corrosive on our democracy. 
Now, to fix that, you either need a constitutional amendment or you need a different Supreme Court or you need a whole bunch of different policies that can actually reduce the influence of money in politics. So these are all actual things that we can do. But I think what Obama has also said is that, and I very much believe this to be true, I think we've come to think of democracy in our country as a little too transactional, which is, you know, people go to the polls, if they go to the polls, and you know, I'm gonna hand you my vote, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vote for this guy, and if I vote for you, then you're gonna in turn fix the country. <laughs> you're gonna fix my problems, and it's very transactional. And that's not what democracy in a representative government is supposed to be. This is self-government, right? And the idea behind self-government is for citizens to be involved, not just on election day, but every single day. And in America, we need to think of it that way, and we need to be more involved, not just when we vote, but when we push our representatives on things, and when we, when we have a real public debate that's not just sound bites thrown back and forth on the news. Um, and so, we always said this in 2008 when he was running, he said, you know, the problems I'm talking about, they can't be solved in one year or one term or one presidency, and they certainly can't be solved by one president alone. And I think no matter who succeeds Barack Obama, this election or the next, next election after that or the election after that, like no one person, either in the presidency or in Congress, is gonna be able to fix the problems that we have in our country or the problems that we have in the world. The way that it gets fixed is with an engaged, active citizenry. And I believe that Obama's work after he leaves the White House will be directed towards you know, making sure that people stay engaged in the political process, in public life, in organizing, in being part of their communities, and in really fulfilling um, the tenets of self-government that are at the core of our country. Thank you very much for your question. John, thank you very much. That has been absolutely this fascinating. Um, if you could all please uh, remain seated while John leaves the chamber. And for one last time, thank you very much, John Favreau. <laughs>